When we make New Year's resolutions, they often end up being about relationships, either with ourselves or with others. Many of us want to connect or reconnect with our loved ones. As an example, I might say, I'm finally going to take my wife on that trip to wine country that we've been thinking about for so long. Shakespeare wrote, Come, gentlemen and ladies, I hope we shall drink down all unkindnesses. Maybe this year, my brother and I can finally put away our differences. Jesus said in the book of Matthew, If it should happen, therefore, that while you are presenting your offering upon the altar, and right there you remember that your brother has any grievance against you, leave your offering there upon the altar, and first go and make peace with your brother, and then come back and present your offering. Many of us also want to connect or better connect with ourselves to feel like we are moving in a positive direction from within. I'm going to lose 30 pounds this year if it kills me. I won't kill you. <laughs> Dr. Phil said, a year from now, you're going to weigh less or more than what you do right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I want to make more money this year, plain and simple. Hafiz wrote, love is the cash you need. All are the kinds of silver buy strange things. Love is the part of the treasure you need to craft, to craft falcon winds and return to your true realm of divine freedom. My New Year's resolution is fairly simple. Do the next right thing. The Buddha said, Ardently do today what must be done. Who knows? Tomorrow, death comes. I hope my New Year's won't be so hectic. I'm tired of all the running around all the time. Howard Truman echoed Psalm 4610. In the stillness of the quiet, if we listen, we can hear the whisper of the heart giving strength to weakness, courage to fear, hope to despair. I want to begin each morning with meditation. Thich Nhat Hanh taught, Buddhist meditation has two aspects, looking deeply because it can bring us insight and liberate us from suffering and afflictions, but the practice of stopping is fundamental. If we cannot stop, we cannot have insight. And sometimes we have a desire for resolution without clarity of purpose. I'm not sure what my New Year's resolution should be. All I know is that 2019 has got to be better than the last one. Well, Rumi wrote, let yourself be silently drawn by the strange pull of what you really love. It will not lead you astray. And your heart knows the way. Run in that direction. I don't know why I even bother making New Year's resolutions. <laughs> I never seem to be able to keep them. <laughs> the Apostle Paul wrote about this to his letter <clears throat> in his letter to the Romans. I have the de desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Julian of Norwich wrote, All shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. No matter what you're contemplating, setting as New Year's resolutions, or if you're even thinking about it, it is only natural in these moments like these to hope for something better, something truer, something more authentic. And the last hours of any year and the one to follow is a natural stopping point to consider the wellness of all manner of things. And as we stand here on the annual threshold, most of us think, think, I cannot help but think about making improvements in our lives. It's the same with all new beginnings. It's like when you buy your first new car. 
You promise yourself that you're going to keep it clean. You're going to follow every single one of the manufacturer's recommendations on upkeep. And you're going to park it at the farthest space in the parking lot so that no one will scratch it. But then you get the first scratch and another. After that comes the first flat tire and you spill a cup of coffee on the new carpet. And soon your, car, your new car is not so perfect anymore. But even a little, but, but even after that, there's a little fender bender. It's still a good car. Soon the odometer turns over 80,000 mile, miles, but that car keeps running almost as, almost as smoothly as when you bought it. Now my analogy is going to get a little thin here because most of you would have a new car, bought a new car last year or maybe even one this year. But for the sake of pretending for my imagery, okay, that, that we were all raised by my father who was the one that gave me all of that advice I just shared with you. Let's pretend that we were all raised by my daddy and that you drove that car until, and then you, what he says is, is that you drive that car until the parts are too expensive to replace and then you get a new one. In the meantime, you follow a regular maintenance program. You change your oil regularly, as well as your air filters and your oil filters. You replace the fan belts and the tires and all that other stuff when it's needed. And oh, be very, very careful that you don't run into a car or a tree or a post. Now, I know some of you I'm repeating myself here. I just realized this is the second pair of time I've said that. But every single one of us walking into this new year with the same mind and the same body, for those of us believe, believe we have one, the same spirit. Here's where my daddy's advice still holds truth. You have to keep driving all three. All, all three. You have to keep driving all three until the parts get too expensive to replace. So wisdom should tell us that we must pay attention to their upkeep. And today is as good a day as any to begin. We don't have to wait two years from now. As Eleanor wrote Roosevelt, or two days from now, as Eleanor Roosevelt wrote, every day is a new day with new strengths and new thoughts. With the dawning of each new day come rich opportunities to make changes that feed the mind, care for the body, and nurture the spirit. Before I move on, I think I should address the negative idea that I sure is floating around in the room that New Year's resolutions don't work. In researches that I've read as I prepared for this sermon, I came across studies conducted to answer that specific question. A psychologist at Scranton University in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, John Norcross, conducted a research project during the week of December 25th through January the 1st, asking 400 people if they planned to make New Year's resolutions. He went further on to find out whether or not they were successful. On their initial calls, his re researchers found that responses fell into three categories. There were some who said, I'm not interested. I don't make New Year's resolutions. And I'm sure there are some of those in this room. Others stated that they planned to make some changes in the new year, but they didn't do that New Year's resolution thing. And the third group said that they did intend to make New Year's resolutions. The test, the test uh, found that those in that third group were actually more successful. The second group that was thinking about it were contacted to find out if they had actually started some new plan, some new thing in their life to make their lives better. The study showed that 51% had continued with their plan two weeks after they started. A call to the same group six months later found that number had dropped 
to 4% who were successfully working their plan. Now, the group who had made New Year's resolutions were contacted two, year, two weeks after the 1st of January, and 71% were, were sticking to it. Six months later, they, they were called, and that number had dropped to 46%, continuing to follow their resolutions. A lowering yes, but those who made New Year's resolutions demonstrated that they were 10 times more successful in keeping them. Dr. Norcross allowed that the numbers were, like, uh, were likely to be thrown off by the fact that the participants knew they were part of a study. And because the last week of the year, we become more attentive to what's coming ahead of us. Lastly, each, 46, 40, uh, each of the 46% New Year goal setters were interviewed in order to determine what attributes made them more successful. If you were like me, you might think mo they were more motivated, they were, had more willpower, and they had self-control. Yes, some people do. But this has proved not to be the case. Rather, being highly motivated, they were successful because of an accumulation of small goals and small victories. Additionally, the group were, were self, uh, this group was self-facilitators rather than strong-willpowered. Finally, instead of possessing higher self-control, they presented as being more self-aware. Now, for those of, the, uh, those of you who declined to participate, and said they had no plans to make New Year's resolutions, I have a bit of a um, recommendation for you. There is a part in every living thing that wants to become itself. The tadpole into the frog, the chrysalis into the butterfly, a damaged human being into a whole one. That is defined as spirituality by the poet Ellen Bass. If you are not comfortable with her word spirituality, you can replace it with conscience or as Jesus experienced in the wilderness, that still small voice. But there is something inside of each and every one of us that compels us forward, that compels us into new beginnings, that compels us to walk across new thresholds. No matter how you name it, each of us has a calling to become our higher selves, to a higher level of being. Some of you may have already begun to make your New Year's resolutions. For those of you who are considering waiting, you might think about starting now. No matter what your perspective on making resolutions, I'd like to challenge you this morning to consider examining the Unitarian Universalist principles as a roadmap for making a change in how you can better participate in this community of faith. No matter what other New Year's resolutions you're making, I think there's an opportunity for us as we revisit our New Year's our principles of faith. And I'm going to ask you to pull out your hymnals. And the very front of them, what page is it, Scott? Right here. And the very first, right after the table of com, com, uh, con, yeah, contents and the preface, there is our, um, our principles. And I'd like you to read them with me, okay? We, the member congregations of Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, acceptance of one another, and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, 
respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Now I'd like for you really just to take a moment and reflect upon these principles and to consider whether any one of them touches a chord of doubt in your mind about whether or not you are truly living out these principles. And I'm going to give you a couple of moments to do that. To give you an example, Sarah McNeil and I um, spent uh, the night one week, one night this week with three homeless families at the Clemson Presbyterian Room in the Inn. As a matter of perspective, our fellowship had previously participated in the same program at Fort Hill Presbyterian, where the families were usually bedded down by the time we got there in separate rooms on a long hall, and there was really great acoustics. At, Cle at Clemson Pres, they, ha they now have a house on their property where they host families in the room for in room in the end program. When we arrived there Thursday night, there were three families with children who had the run of the house, and I do mean run. It goes without saying that it was a bit of a shock for someone like me who lives a relatively quiet life. Um, to walk in with six kids running and shouting all over the living room. I have to confess to you that I panicked a little bit and ran away to mine and Sarah's room and got busy making up my bed and putting away my clothes and setting out my little computer so that I could just spend as much time away in that little side space without facing all the chaos that was going on in the rest of the house. Sarah, bless her heart, was much braver than I. It was re it's always a really difficult time to sleep uh, in those circumstances because they have the fold-out carts. But at two o'clock in the at one o'clock in the morning and at two o'clock in the morning and at three o'clock in the morning, there were still televisions turned on in all of the rooms. And so I finally gave up and just decided that I was not going to get any sleep. So I got up. And I went into the dining room area, which was the farthest room possible from the bedrooms. And I closed off the doors and I sat down there and I was going to do a little bit of reading and writing a few notes for today's service. And I had, it was really kind of cool. I mean, I was kind of wide awake and um, it was quiet and I was enjoying myself. And then one of the mothers gets up. And bless her heart, she was she had some kind of bug or some kind of flu. But still she came in and she just wanted to ask me all these questions about what I was doing and where I was from and you know and, and tell me about herself and everything. And I could I must confess that I was not terribly patient with her. Um, I considered that my quiet space. And she had invaded my quiet space. I didn't really get it until the following morning when I had come home and I had gone to bed and I had slept for about four hours. And then I woke up and I realized how really unkind I had been to that young woman. I never thought about the challenges that she lives with in her everyday life as a homeless mother of three very energetic kids. I didn't think about the fact that she was coughing and didn't feel well and couldn't sleep. Um, I just was worried about my own little thing. And I was going to talk today about our second principle, but I realized that our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity, <sighs> of every person is, a, is, is something I still need to do some work on. I thought I had that one down, but I don't. And there are questions that we can ask ourselves about every single one of our principles, and it doesn't mean that we have to work on every one of them every day. 
But I think it's a good idea if at least once or twice or a little bit more every week, we sit down and we read them. And we think about those days that have passed and those that are coming ahead of us to consider really if we are living as good Unitarian Universalists. Um, I have to confess, I'm not doing so well sometimes. I have desires, I have hopes, and I hope in the new year that I will do a better job. This brings me to an important point. When you strive for being in a new way, you cannot count on your fears and doubts not to show up. The Persian poet Hafiz says, there is nothing in your mind that you have not invented already. No event in your life <clears throat> that, you, that you have not driven a very hard bargain for. It's like what the Buddha the Buddhist says, that, it, that this is because that is. And that is one that I've really had to work on, but I read Thich Nhat Hanh's explanation of it the other day, and it really makes, it helps me make a little bit more sense out of it. <coughs> Thich Nhat Hanh wrote, it means that everything is connected, everything. Whatever you are experiencing now is connected to, generated by, in some way a response to all that you have already created. The present is made up of material, made up of materials called past and future, and the past and future are here in what we call the present. Everything that I brought forward into that dining room the other night was part and parcel of everything that I had brought with me from behind. And it means that when we are in the process of thinking about the future, we're bringing that stuff along with us. And we have to be aware and we have to think about what that is back there. What's happened in the last year and the year before that and the year before that. We have to think about that in terms of making our resolutions or making plans for how we're going to live more lovingly in the world. There's a Roman um, lesser god called Janus, whose face is depicted on coins that were often placed besides people's doorways into their homes. And it depicts the head of Janus looking this way and that way, looking both to the past and to the future. Now, one article that I read said that the name January came came from from the from the god Janus, but I read other articles that didn't say that. So I don't know which is true. But I think it's a wonderful image of we're standing here on the threshold, and we are ready to begin a new year. What I'm going to invite you to do now is to again go back to our principles and to give some thought to them and perhaps some other New Year's resolutions that you're making for yourself. And I want you to think in terms of what are the barriers, what are the doubts, what are the fears that are standing in your way of realizing your highest self, your highest potential. And on those little pieces of paper that were given to you um, by the ushers as you came in this morning, I'm going to invite you to write down just briefly on those pieces of paper what you hope to leave behind as you enter in to the new year. And as you do so, I want to share a reading from you from one of my favorite theologians, Howard Thurman. It's called Meditations on the Heart. Despite the dullness and barrenness of the days that pass, 
If I search with due diligence, I can always find a deposit left by some former radiance. But I had forgotten. At the time, it was full-orbed, glorious, and resplendent. I was sure that I would never forget. In the moment of its fullness, I was sure that it would illumine my path for the rest of my journey. I had forgotten how easy it was to forget. There was not intent to betray what seemed so sure at the time. My response was whole and clean and authentic. But little by little, there crept into my life the dust and the grit of the journey. Details, lower level demands, all kinds of cross currents, nothing momentous, nothing overwhelming, nothing fragrant, just wear and tear. If there had been some direct challenge, a clear cut issue, I would have fought it to the end and beyond. In the quietness of this place, Surrounded by all prevailing presence of God, my heart whispers, keep fresh before me the moments of my highest resolve, that in fair weather or foul, in good times and in tempest, in the days when the darkness and the foe are nameless and unnumbered, I may forget that to which my life is committed. Amen. Amen.